to start now. Uh, this is 3.02. I guess if anybody hasn't joined yet, then uh, they will catch up whenever they join in. My name is Oke Okere, and I would like to welcome us all up to um, this Cubing session focusing on doing business in Africa with special focus on Nigeria. I'm going to share my screen right now and I hope that uh, you would see it. If you cannot see my screen, please let me know. Okay. So I'm going to share that. Fantastic. All right, so we're starting off. My name is Oke Okewe, like I said, I'm the associate partner for Host City Insights, and I am the country manager of Host City Insights in Nigeria. So it's a pleasure to welcome you to this Cube In session. I hope you can hear me clearly. If you can't, please send a message so that I'll know and try to speak a bit louder. So first of all, we'll talk about Cubin. Cubin was designed to help European SMEs with uh, business and innovation in emerging markets. And it was set up by a consortium of experts in the field of cultural differences with the involvement of SME support and innovation agencies. And it is financed by the EU, the European Commission. Um, Cubin also has learning circles organized by ICUNet and Hostility Insights. And these learning circles are targeted at uh, decision makers of SMEs from specific industries Participation in the learning circles is free for SMEs, and the selection process will also ensure that only the SMEs with the highest potential, uh, so potential to succeed, are selected. Some practical information and some housekeeping. Uh, your microphones will be already tuned to, to the mute uh, section, so it will be muted already, so that we can have the best sound quality during the webinar. If you have questions that you would like to ask me directly, please use the chat window and I will see those and I will respond to those questions as soon as I can. Uh, but if you have general questions, um, please um, use the chat box as well and address everyone so that we can all benefit from those questions. But at the end of this webinar, we will also have a, a question and answer time where I can respond to some of the questions that you have asked, which I have not answered already. <coughs> A bit about me, I've been in the services profession now for almost 20 years and I've worked mostly in Nigeria and in other African countries as well. I've been involved with uh, investment advisory, I've been involved with business research and analysis, helping companies who want to enter into Nigeria or other countries in Africa to look at the strategies that they would use in, in entering these markets. I've also helped with economic advisory as well to help um, businesses, banks, investors to understand the various economies that they want to invest in, specifically Nigeria and other countries in, in West Africa and Africa as well. And I've been involved with learning and development, organizational analysis, finance, credit risk management, and program management as well. So that's about me. We'll dive right into it. Peter Drucker said, um, what managers do is the same all over the world, but how they do it will depend on their culture. It will depend on their culture. So what, we, what you want to do is to win business and to find the right partners. But how you achieve that, it has a lot to do with the amount of time and investment you make in understanding the culture of your target market. So understanding culture is very important. Understanding culture is very important. And who best to define culture for us? But the, uh, expert himself, Professor Ket Hostidi, said that culture is the collective programming of the mind which distinguishes the members of one group or category of people from another. And Hostidi has uh, six dimensions which some of us might be uh, familiar with, but for those of us who are not familiar with the six dimensions, I would just like to use a few minutes to lock down the theoretical foundation that we will discuss at some other point in time in this um, webinar. Oh, sorry. Can you can hear me? You can only see the first slide now. You can only see the first slide? Yes. OK, hold on one second. I hope something isn't stuck. Yes. Now it's now it's moving. Uh, it's moving now? Full, yeah. Could you also make it full screen so it's in the presenter mode? OK. OK. 
Let's see. Can you see full screen now? No. Can you see the full screen now? No. It's in full screen. Okay. Uh, it is full screen on my side. Okay. Can you see it now? No, it's not full screen still. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll reshare again. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and then I will reshare. Okay. Great. So maybe I'll show, let me share my screen instead of uh, the presentation. I'll share my screen so that I'll, I'll, I'll basically be seeing what you see. Can you see what I see? Yes. Good. So we're back. And can you see the full screen now? Yes, perfect. Fantastic. Yes. Can you see me? <laughs> yes. You can see me. Okay, great. Awesome. So um, I, I mentioned that uh, I'll go back just one, one step. I said culture is a correct programming, which uh, Get Hofstede, Professor Get Hofstede put together. And six dimensions, power distance, which is the dimension that looks at hierarchy versus equality. How does a culture handle inequality? IDV, which is um, individualism versus collectivism, we codify that as IDV, dependence on others, not dependence on the general society, but dependence on, a, on groups of individuals within the society. How much do you depend on in-groups in your society? Masculinity versus femininity, which talks about performance versus caring. How is a society tilted towards motivation? as a concept. And then uh, uncertainty avoidance, which is how the society deals with, it, with the unknown. Long-term orientation talks about flexibility versus discipline, the time perspective of the society. Uh, a society that is long-term oriented will not be looking at uh, the gains of the, of, of, the, of the next quarter. They will be looking at the next 10 years, for instance. And then indulgence versus restraint, which is how a society's culture deals with natural drives. And so we come to Africa. Africa is often referred to as the last frontier. The world is looking at Africa for growth because uh, the potential growth rates of African countries is far higher than their current growth rates. Africa can only grow in order to survive. Uh, for this session, we will look at Africa in general, and then we will look at Nigeria <clears throat> in more detail. So Africa in general and Nigeria in more detail. And I will go from topic to topic in that way. So welcome to Africa. There are about 1.3 billion people in Africa. And Africa has about 54 sovereign countries. The middle class in Africa is around 34% of the population. Now this is the middle class as defined by the African Development Bank. And according to the African Development Bank, that middle class refers to people who, are, who live on uh, $20 a day and above, $20 a day on, and above. So house, household income for a household of about five people, something in the region of about $35,000, uh, $20 a day, um, which is quite low compared to European countries, if you, if you have to say, but that is the, de the definition that the African Development Bank has. Africa's GDP is around $3.52 trillion, $3.5 trillion, which is just um, about $100 billion less than the GDP of Germany. So again, you see that there's a lot of potential for growth here uh, as Africa's GDP at the moment. And Africa's economies, uh, on average together, they are growing at about 5.5% per annum. But I need to make this point clear here not all African countries are growing at that rate. Some African countries are growing much slower. In Africa, there are many languages. In fact, Africa is the most diverse continent on earth. There are over 1,500 uh, languages and ethnicities in Africa, over 1,500 languages and ethnicities. It is the second largest continental landmass. Asia is bigger in terms of land, but in terms of diversity, Africa is the most diverse. And in terms of official languages as well, you have English, French, Arabic, Portuguese, and Spanish. And the use of all of these languages will depend on the history of the country and the, col and the colonial history as well. So those are the things that determine the languages that they speak. 
Africa is also a very young continent. Uh, the median age in Africa is about 19, and more than 60% of Africans are under the age of 25. So that again points to the fact that it is a market for the future, it's a growth market. And there are many issues with conflict and terrorism in Africa, in certain areas of Africa, but they are usually not as bad as they are reported. And I can tell you this because um, a lot of times when I travel to Europe, people always ask me about African countries and how safe they are. And I do have to tell them that you have a lot of businesses operating here in Africa. So it's not usually as bad as it is about reported. Now, when I think of Africa, I like to use the illustration of a gun, because if you look at the map of Africa and you tilt it sideways, it looks like a gun, sort of, you know, and a gun has three important parts. It has a hammer, it has the, the barrel, and it has the, uh, the trigger. And there are three countries in Africa that occupy this position. There's Egypt as the hammer, there's South Africa as the, as the, as the barrel, and then there's Nigeria as the trigger. These three countries in Africa are probably the most important countries you want to focus on. And I'm not saying that other countries are not important, but in terms of their influence, in terms of their size, they are the biggest countries in Africa. Together, these three countries control 43% of Africa's GDP. Together, they are 27% 20, of the population, just a, bit, a little bit above one quarter of Africans. They are the most influential countries in their regional blocks. They are the most attractive business hubs. And uh, by sheer size, and with other factors as well, Nigeria probably should be the most important focus. And of course, I might say that because I'm Nigerian, but then indeed, uh, Nigeria is a country that is very large and uh, also one of the biggest attractors of investment into Africa. Nigeria has about uh, 198 million people almost 200 million people, is the seventh largest country in the world in terms of population. But in terms of landmass, uh, Nigeria is just a little bit bigger than the state of Texas in America. So that, that should give you an idea of how the country is. It's, it's very large in terms of population, but perhaps not so large in terms of the landmass. It's a very young population as well. <clears throat> Nigeria currently has uh, an American-styled um, American democracy as a president, and we've had stable democracy now in Nigeria for almost 20 years. Uh, we have a Senate and we have a House of Representatives, similar to the US Senate and the Congress. We have 36 states in Nigeria with elected governors as well. And we have a federal capital, capital territory, which is similar to Washington DC in Abuja in Nigeria, our federal capital territory. And it's right in the, right in the middle of Nigeria, if you can see my cousin, it's right in the middle. The former capital used to be Lagos, but it was moved to Abuja right in the center of Nigeria. Nigeria's GDP, is, that's gross domestic product, the economy of Nigeria is about $380 billion. Now I need to put a bit, a bit of a, a perspective in here. The economy actually shrunk uh, two years ago because the country experienced <clears throat> a recession, the first one in 25 years. Prior to the recession, the, the country's GDP was as high as $514 billion. So but the country suffered a recession and currently the GDP, the gross domestic product, is around $380 billion. And this evens out to about $1,800 per, per capita, per head. So it basically means that it's a country that has widespread poverty. And unfortunately as well, Nigeria is the home to the largest number of the world's poorest people around 80 million people, just something around 40% of Nigerians live below the poverty line. But you do have a middle class of about 25% of the population, around 50 million people that earn or live on uh, more than uh, $20 a day. So it's a sizable chunk as well. It's about the size of the UK, just a little bit smaller than the UK in terms of the population of people that are in the middle class, which is quite large. And crude oil is Nigeria's main export. It accounts for about 75% of export revenues. In terms of demographics, Nigeria is almost equally split between Christianity and Islam. Islam is mostly in the north, and Christianity is mostly in the south. Um, there, we've had, unfortunately, um, a history of terrorism in, the, in Nigeria, but it's quite isolated, usually in the north, 
most, mostly in the northeastern part of Nigeria where I'm pointing to, and it is shared with three other countries, Cameroon, Chad, and Niger Republic. And up until recently, because it stopped now, we used to have conflicts in the south, but the ones in the south are resource-based. It has to do with oil. So, but those have ceased uh, recently. Nigeria's official language is English, but it's also a very diverse country. I think it's the second most diverse country in the world after Indonesia, if I remember clearly. Um, there are over 300 ethnic groups in Nigeria, uh, over, over 300 languages in Nigeria, but we all speak English officially. Um, and Nigeria as a country is divided into six zones, which I'm pointing out here, the Northwest, the Northeast, the North Central, Southwest, South South, and Southeast. And those divisions are based on uh, historical uh, tribal um, um, alignments. So when you're looking at Africa, it's always important to realize that Africa has two systems. And one of our colleagues uh, in Hostility Insights, Alex Vonk, brought this to my attention recently. Africa has two systems. And when you deal with Africa, you have to understand that there is a traditional Africa and there is a modern Africa. And these two societies, they exist side by side. In Africa, it's very common to see traditional law still being enforced and traditional law enforcement methods still being used. And at the same time, you will see, um, you will see uh, modern laws uh, and modern law enforcement methods being used. Um, governance is the same. You have traditional governments with chiefs and kings, but at the same time, they run side by side with elected politicians, governors and uh, mayors and the presidents. <laughs> at the same time, there's traditional medicine and then there's modern medicine. And in the same way, you have traditional business rules and you have a modern business rule. This is important because in several instances, you have to fulfill the requirements of both systems. So when you're putting a strategy for Africa in place, you must take this into account. How do I navigate the traditional system and the modern system without uh, making it uh, very cumbersome for my business? So it's one of the things you have to think about. Africa is... Uh, faces a lot of challenges in the area of governance. We've had governance issues in Africa. Um, democracy is still a relatively new concept in Africa, if you look at it in, in, uh, critically. Um, you have instances in Africa where several African leaders have been in power for more than 30 years, and they are elected, elected every time. So some of those things that, uh, some of the things we have to consider as some of the challenges in terms of governance. But when you look at Hofstede's dimensions, it, it sort of like explains why this, this is. Because most African countries are high PDI, that's high power distance, and uh, low individualism, that is, we are collective societies. So because of that, you see that the rule of law is seldomly equitably applied. And also, you, you tend to see where the strong leaders can continue to propagate themselves in power. And sadly, peaceful change of government especially from one political party to another political party, is often rare or violent. So you have to consider this. And thinking about it, the question is, if you're coming into Africa, you have to consider how you're going to stay neutral to fly below the radar so that you don't get uh, the attention of governments as much as you can. You want to navigate carefully around that. Or you can find local partners that can help you navigate so because government sometimes can, be, can take interest in foreign or local companies that they perceive to be quite powerful or might challenge their positions. Nigeria, my country, um, in terms of governance, currently we are facing an election in, next year in February. Uh, next year, uh, we will have had uh, 20 years of unbroken democratic rule, and there are several uh, political parties and uh, several presidential aspirants right now, but uh, most analysts see it as, as a tussle between two uh, individuals, between Atiku Abibaka, who used to be the vice president of Nigeria from 1999 to 2007, and the current leader, uh, President Muhammadu Buhari, who was also a former military dictator in the 80s. So in Nigeria, we have issues with corruption, 
Um, there are a lot of efforts being made to change the system, but the rule of law is still a challenge. Uh, both candidates are in their 70s. Both candidates are from the north of Nigeria, and both candidates are Muslim. So it's a very interesting take. But a lot will depend on the outcome of the results. And it's difficult to project what the election results would uh, look like. But again, when coming into Nigeria, like the rest of Africa, stay neutral in terms of uh, governance, in terms of politics, fly below the radar if you can, or get strong partners to help you navigate. It's impossible to talk about Africa without talking about the infrastructural challenges. Africa has significant infrastructural challenges, roads, rail, rail networks, um, transportation, healthcare, all of those things are major issues here. And if you're coming into Africa, you have to think about how you can circumvent those in infrastructural gaps or how you can build a supply chain resilience and use it to your advantage. There was actually an investor in Africa that said he did not look at the supply chain challenges and the infrastructural challenges in Africa as a, a deterrent, but rather as an opportunity for them to build their own systems and use that to compete against others. So in Nigeria, it's the same. And we have erratic power supply. Uh, public transportation is inadequate or is unsafe. The roads are insufficient, the poly maintained. Uh, the rail networks have not changed very much since colonial times. And uh, Nigeria became independent from the UK uh, in 1960. So even though there are infrastructural challenges, there are also opportunities as well for business because you have a lot of um, investors uh, coming into um, Nigeria and other African countries, and they are looking at investing in infrastructure uh, because you have some efforts at privatization and uh, um, uh, PPPs, uh, public-private partnerships happening, and these are investment opportunities as well. So it's one of the places that uh, business can look at. And then poverty. Poverty is Africa's burden. Um, this is a graph that from the, from the African Development Bank put together by Bearing Point that shows a rough sketch of what Africa looks like in terms of poverty. Uh, more than 60% of Africans live below the poverty line, um, and then you have a floating class of about 20%. You have the lower middle class, upper middle class, and the upper class. So you have to think, if you're coming into Africa, what can I sell to the poor? How should I package it? And one of the ideas in terms of packaging is unitization. And I will talk about unitization later in this uh, webinar. Some more challenges, environmental challenges. Desertification is an issue. The desert, the Sahara Desert, is coming down more to the south, I think by about 10 meters or so every year. Um, food security is an issue. And then terror and conflict, like we mentioned already, those are some of the issues we face. But then there are upsides. Uh, Africa is mineral rich. You have a lot of gold, you have a lot of coal, you have diamonds, you have oil in Africa. Africans are amazing people. They are very welcoming to visitors um, and to foreign, uh, foreign investors as well. It is the market of the future. Um, more than 63% uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the continent is under 25. And it's a continent that is rapidly embracing technology, especially mobile technology. That picture shows with the guys taking a selfie on the beach. So business and trust, you are coming into Africa or any other environment to do business, it's very important to win trust because when you win trust, then you win business. And it has a lot of impact on, on how you communicate um, on, in the workplace etiquette, in the meeting etiquette, and how you look at organizational hierarchies, whether you will get repeat business or not, and the future relationships. Trust is really important. So to build trust, or to win trust, you must understand and you must also respect the local cultures, right? And look at the cultural iceberg. You can take a look at that later. There are aspects of culture you can't see and there are aspects of culture you can see. Uh, but we will look at values now, cultural values, and try and see if we can connect that with Africa um, and how to um, work here. If you're culturally savvy, you must understand that there's a difference between individuals and groups. Uh, individuals might differ from the group, but the group provides you with a template in terms of how you should prepare yourself. You must be open-minded and be aware of differences. You must also be adaptable and changeable as well. We've talked about the, the six dimensions 
but I will talk about Nigeria now and Africa and tell you how this plays out in business. Most African countries have high power distance. They are collectivist cultures, that is low individualism. Um, they have low masculinity in terms of, uh, it, they are more caring rather than uh, achievement focused. Uh, authority avoidance is uh, average and uh, long-term orientation is low and uh, indulgence is high. Nigeria typifies most other African countries except on one dimension, which is masculinity. Unlike other African countries, Nigeria is a very masculine, very achievement-focused society. So in terms of power distance, Nigeria scored very high. So this means that when you're working in Nigeria, you must understand that the general perception is that the boss is always right. Even when he's wrong, he's right. <laughs> this is true for most of Africa, particularly traditional Africa. So um, you have to respect hierarchies when you come into Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Rank, status, those things uh, are very important and you must know how to deal with those. Subordinates usually would defer to their boss and then the boss in turn is respected to look after the interests of the subordinates. In terms of individualism versus collectivism, Nigeria and most other African countries are collectivists. This means that people are structured in multiple in-groups. So family is important. Uh, my social group is important. My church, my mosque, my, uh, my schoolmates, my school, things like that are important. So individuals have responsibilities to their group and group think is very common. Individuals will want to think and act in line with what their groups dictate so that they don't lose face to prevent shame. So what do we take away from, from this? When you're building personal and business relationships in Africa, you have to understand that these relationships often intertwine and uh, there are no clear defining uh, boundaries. So you have to also establish personal relationships uh, with Africans and African business people to show that you are dependable and you need to invest time in that. You must respect the hierarchy and some of the issues to look out for and some ways to connect family, friends, ethnicity, and religion. But do be careful, particularly with the last two, ethnicity and religion, because they can be very uh, touchy issues in Africa and in Nigeria particularly. In terms of masculinity, we've uh, established that Nigeria scored high on the masculine uh, dimension. So what does this mean? It's a country that, uh, it's a society that promotes the symbols of success and achievement and competition it's seen as a regular aspect of life. So in Nigeria, your status is important. And status symbols like cars, expensive lunches, power dressing, um, they are important in Nigeria. And depending on the kind of business that you do, it might also be important to highlight your certifications, your degrees, your awards, all of those things, they matter. Uh, uncertainty avoidance, uh, Nigeria is medium uh, in terms of uncertainty avoidance, which means that the country is comfortable with uh, or the country's society, the culture here, allows a certain degree of ambiguity. And this also means that the loopholes and shortcuts are allowed, encouraged sometimes. Some of these shortcuts or loopholes may not necessarily be uh, legal. In Nigeria, we have a joke. Uh, we say, idea is need, uh, which basically means that um, you don't need to know everything to win a contract. You just need to have an idea of it, just basic knowledge, or maybe an idea of the basic knowledge even. So what this implies is queue jumping is not allowed, it's frowned upon, however you can do it if you, have, if you can show that you're worth it. And uh, people tend not to follow the rules uh, properly. And there's also a, a high tendency to see falsified uh, documentations, falsified certificates and documents. All of these things are as a result of uh, the UAI. So when you come into Nigeria and you want to choose contractors, you want to choose partners, you want to choose staff, you probably have to um, look at their certification and their qualifications very, very carefully. Long-term orientation, Nigeria is short-termist in nature, and this has several uh, um, implications in Nigeria in terms of credit cards. For instance, Nigerians, um, we don't use credit cards, but not by choice. There was a story of a bank that came in uh, in the early 2000s, they went aggressively into the market, they released credit cards, uh, many Nigerians subscribed to the credit cards, and then the bank almost failed because many of these Nigerians quickly became overburdened with debt and they could not pay on the credit cards. So access to credit is tight in Nigeria for economic reasons first, but also because 
there's been a history of abuse when you, you, you make it easy for people to get loans and people to get credit cards. And it's because the, the culture is short-termist. People, people would like to take advantage now. They would like to look at results now. And they will do whatever they can to achieve those results sometimes. And the culture is very indulgent as well. Uh, indulgence, according to Hofstede, um, has a, a correlation or it deals with what we call subjective well-being, that's happiness. So despite all its troubles, Nigeria regularly ranks amongst the happiest countries in the world. And because of an indulgent culture, you tend to see that Nigerians will spend on luxury goods and services whenever they can afford it. The country has long been associated with luxury goods and luxury consumption. We are the highest consumers of champagne in, in, in Africa and one of the highest in the world. Um, we, in, in the 80s, for instance, Nigeria was the highest, the second largest consumer of video cassette recorder, uh, tape players, uh, video VCRs. Nigeria was the second highest uh, consumer of VCRs in the world in the 80s. You know, so those are things to, to, to consider. We want to cooperate with Nigerians, to do business with Nigerians, realize again that relationships are important. You have to invest heavily in your personal relationships. You have to respect the hierarchy. And, but at the same time, you also should consider multi-layered relationships. What do I mean? Um, you look for the person with the power in the group, but at the same time, you make sure that other members of the group are carried along. Uh, there is uh, heavy bureaucracy in Nigeria. It's something to think about. I mean, the government is doing what it can to, to reduce the red tape, but it is there. And the last thing to also know when you're trying to cooperate with Nigerians is to expect bargaining. We are very good at uh, uh, looking for deals. So you, you will expect that uh, when you want to sell to Nigerians, uh, they will argue with you on the price. So you probably want to keep a little bit of room for pricing so that you can negotiate. So um, nothing is ever finished until it's completely done. Sometimes even after you have closed your negotiations, you can see that particularly with the larger companies, they can come back to you and try and reopen the negotiations again. So it's important to always realize that. Right, so in terms of marketing and sales, what are some of the things to bear in mind? Remember the two Africans, that's the first thing. Remember the two Africans, traditional Africa and modern Africa. Traditional Africa would like to sell in the open air, unstructured market, but modern Africa, you will find them in the mall. Now, it doesn't mean that you will strictly find the traditional African in the open market only. Sometimes they go to the mall and vice versa. So, but you have to understand that. Some brands come into Nigeria, and their best approach is to go into the unstructured open market. Excuse me. But then some other brands will use the malls, uh, the covered market, and, and they will do better. What about unitization? When I was a kid, um, this is how milk is sold, was sold to us when, we were, when I was a kid. And this is how milk is being sold in, in, in uh, European countries, uh, in the developed world. A 400 gram, 500 gram, uh, kilogram tin. But in a country, and this happened sometime in the 80s, when poverty became a major issue in Africa in the 80s, when African countries became very poor, we found out that it was difficult for people who were living on $2 a day to afford to buy one of these. A tin of milk like this, a 400 gram tin is about $10. For somebody who's living on less than $2 a day, they can't afford that. So what did one company do to, to break into the market? They unitized. Instead of selling the 400 gram team, they started selling five gram sachets. And instead of selling it at $10, of course, they sold at 10 cents, thereabouts. So 10 cents, five grams, they will buy it and they will split it for two children or three children and they will share that. And it's their milk for the day. So it's something to think about. Um, one of the ways you can break into the poor market is unitization. They may not be able to buy it, buy it in large quantities or in the quantities that you are used to selling. You might have to repackage your product or your service into smaller quantities. And then, of course, the question for us will be, can we package this idea, can we reformat this idea for services like banking or insurance or other kinds of services? I believe that unitization can be applied in those areas as well. E-commerce is growing fast in Nigeria. These are some of the largest e-commerce businesses in Nigeria. E-commerce is growing really, really fast in Nigeria. Like I mentioned, there is a middle class of about 50 million people, and technology adoption, the rate of adoption is quite high. 
So it's something that you might also consider either partnering with some of these or establishing your own e-commerce channels when you're coming into Nigeria and Africa. When you're having meetings and negotiations, you have to remember again our cultural makeup in Africa, high power distance, um, low individualism, and for Nigeria, uh, high masculinity. You have to think about who to approach. You have to be clear on the value you're bringing, and you have to invest in building your contacts and building relationships. A meeting is not confirmed until when you reconfirm it. So do all you can to make sure that um, the people that you're gonna meet, they're on the same page with you. Um, when you're going for a meeting, you try and match the level. You try and match the level because it's a high power distance society. So if you're going to see the CEO, then perhaps the CEO of the company, uh, the interested company should go. And if it is somebody junior who doesn't, who is not empowered to take the decision, then you don't uh, send your CEO. You send somebody at that same level as well. Meetings may not start on time, so be prepared to wait. And you might have several rounds of meetings before the decision is made. How do you dress for a meeting? How do you dress for a meeting? It depends. It depends on the industry you are going to be selling to, but you try and mirror the industry that you want to sell to. Uh, you will never go wrong if you dress formally, and I'm pointing at uh, this gentleman up here, with a business suit and a tie, uh, except if you are dealing in blue collar settings or informal settings, you can't go wrong with this. And you're better off with this so that you can dress down if you have to. Um, for ladies as well, a formal dress or a suit will be fine. Um, and then in some instances you can wear, you can be smart casual with a jacket, the trousers would be good. But I'll tell you some, uh, one secret. In Africa, for most African countries, on Fridays in the offices, they dress down. They wear African dresses. So that's a way you can connect with Africans. You can impress your hosts. Uh, by getting African attire, dressing in, in African attire on Fridays. They certainly will love it and it will, it will break the ice in case you want to come into Africa. When you go for meetings, uh, handshakes are appropriate, um, uh, but there are some cultures, particularly uh, in some of the cultures that are a bit more conservative, um, that in some instances you are not allowed to shake people. Uh, particularly when it comes to if you are a, a gentleman and you want and, and the lady a lady is the person you are meeting with you have to wait until she offers a hand uh, because in some African contests it's it's wrong to to touch uh, somebody of the opposite sex in some African contexts and there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to exchanging business cards but you can ask for their card politely um, because power distance is high and especially in Nigeria because uh, masculinity, that dimension, we, are, we score highly there as well, um, the formal title of the person you're meeting is usually important. And again, this, is, this, this prevails in traditional Africa. In modern Africa, you, you would see people allowing you to address them with their first name only. So, but until you're sure, go with your title, doctor, chief, professor, mister, missus, miss, uh, please go with the title unless you're, you're, you're sure. And address them as sir or madam unless they tell you to use first name. How do you connect? How do you make small talk? Uh, one way you can connect with most Africans is football. And Nigerians in particular, they are addicts. And it's not soccer, it's football in Nigeria. So learn about the national team, Super Eagles in Nigeria. Um, if you're coming to Nigeria or whatever country you're going to learn about their national team, it's usually a, a source of pride for African countries to talk about their football teams. Um, and in Nigeria particularly, the English Premier League is very famous, so it's a place you can, you can uh, create some small talk. Um, they follow other teams in Italy and in Spain as well, Barcelona and Real Madrid, they have a lot of fans in Nigeria. In, in Nigeria. So um, while football is a good place to talk, uh, maybe you want to keep it national so that you don't bring in a club rivalry and stuff, but it's a good place to make a small talk. And then food and drink. Uh, Nigeria. Uh, you can inquire about local foods and drink and sample them, but I need to warn you as well, uh, Nigerian foods are very spicy, <laughs> so um, you can ask for the spices to be reduced if you want to indulge. And then um, movies in Nigeria, music are very large, uh, very big as well. So Nigeria's Nollywood is the second largest movie industry by volume, not by sales, by volume. Uh, in terms of the number of movies released, only Bollywood produces, in Bollywood in India, only Bollywood produces more movies than Nollywood in Nigeria. And Nigerians will love to talk about their families. So those are the, some of the areas you can make small talk, especially their children, when they have children. 
the, the, the love to talk about the children. Of course, you can imagine we love to talk about children. We have 200 million people in Nigeria, and we're growing at 3% 3, 3 every year. So we certainly love to talk about children. And after your meeting with the Nigerians, always follow up. You know, thank them, send them an email, and follow up, follow up via email. Just to close, a few takeaways. Um, Africa and Nigeria, full of contrasts, never assume, always reconfirm. It's usually not as bad as it, it is reported on TV. There are, there are opportunities for long-term growth. Several businesses are thriving here. Um, several multinational businesses are thriving here, and many new businesses are starting. There are many industries that can be considered, industries that relate to infrastructure, relate to healthcare, food, um, transportation. Those industries are welcome here, light manufacturing as well. Those kind of industries are, they will thrive here. Um, even after attending this webinar and uh, several others, it is important that you take time to observe, to ask, and to learn uh, while you are dealing with, local, with different localities in Africa or in Nigeria. And uh, relationships and social status, they matter and they're more important than merit. And it's always important to find a local advisor, a consultant, or a partner, a local business partner to help you with navigating in terms of relationships. And don't forget to follow up on important tasks. And I would like to take questions at this stage. Thank you. I'd like to take questions. Questions? Okay, I see a question about the main business areas or cities inside Nigeria. Should I type them out or should I uh, mention them? I think I will mention and type. Lagos is the first place. Lagos has um, 22 million people, thereabouts. So Lagos is a mega city, a mega city, uh, 22 million people. Bigger than a city, bigger than several European countries. So Lagos is where you want to start in Nigeria. If Lagos was uh, was a country on its own, it would be um, it would be the fifth largest economy in Africa. Lagos, the, the, the economy of, of Lagos is about 150 billion dollars. Um, Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, Abuja, the federal capital territory, FCT, is another place you want to consider. But that will be if you are interested in government contracts. So you go to Abuja, and Abuja contains about roughly uh, two to three million people thereabouts. And then there's Port Harcourt. Harcourt is the, 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 the third largest, I would say, commercial hub. And then there's also Kano in the north. And then uh, if I was to add one more city, I would put, uh, put Ibadan. So those are some of the major cities you want to, you want to look at. Libya, Libya has a question. Is it a safe country to visit for business? Are there things one should be aware about? Yes, it is a safe country to visit for business. Yes, it is a safe country to visit for business. In terms of what you should be aware about, um, uh, when you're traveling to Nigeria, you will get a travel advice usually from uh, the Nigerian Immigration um, uh, um, uh, Office. They will tell you about some of the vaccinations you need to take. Uh, because it's a tropical country, we are a little bit exposed to some tropical diseases that you wouldn't find in Europe or in America, um, malaria, yellow fever, those things, you have to take um, vaccinations for those. And when you come, it is important to know that um, there are certain areas that you will, you will, it will be wise for you not to stay, not to work alone at night. It is a relatively safe place to work in, um, but again, there are, many, there are many cities in Nigeria and they differ or in terms of safety. So it's, it's something that you have to consider city by city. And this is where, again, a local partner can help. Okay. Um, Steven, <laughs> good to know about vaccination. Yes. Good to know about vaccination. The child all. Are there rivalries between Nigeria and neighboring countries? Uh, a visitor or business person should be aware of. <laughs> I've heard a lot about the jello rice debate. <laughs> The, the rivalries are very healthy. The rivalries are very healthy. Um, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, they're very healthy rivalries. They're nothing serious, nothing serious. But you need to be clever when you, when you want to make announcements. And 
uh, you will you would like to tap into national pride in every situation. The general price debate, by the way, Nigeria won won the general price uh, contest. So yes, if you want more information about that, I can give you. <laughs> I probably should have shown a picture of general price anyway. Yeah, so uh, healthy rivalries, healthy healthy rivalries. Any other question? Uh, question over here. Um, are there legal restrictions in place you want that want you to take up into account if someone from the EU wants to do business in Nigeria? Mm, Nigeria right now is encouraging international investment. We are encouraging international investment, so the restrictions are not so difficult. Uh, in fact, in a lot of instances, depending on what you want to do in Nigeria in terms of investment, you can actually get visa on arrival to start with. So legal restrictions are not so cumbersome. It is easy to, to start and run businesses in Nigeria. Um, but you have to bear in mind that we have infrastructural challenges. Okay, but there are some minor restrictions in terms of uh, repatriation of capital. Minor restrictions like you would have in most other countries as well. So minor restrictions. Laima has a question. What is the number one issue European businesses encounter in Nigeria, bureaucracy, yes, but uh, more likely infrastructure and corruption. Infrastructure and corruption. So those are the top three in any uh, in any category: bureaucracy, infrastructure, and corruption. But bureaucracy, in terms of starting your business, is not so hard. But well, getting licenses, if you're going to mine, if you're going to be in the mining industry, for instance, or if you're going to be in uh, some other industry that will require official licensing, it might take you time to get those. But I, I can assure you, because I've done some work with the Nigerian Investment Promotion Council, there are efforts being made to increase uh, the, the, the speed and efficiency of getting licenses, or, or, of providing licenses, and helping businesses uh, come in. So those things are being done. Recently, Nigeria moved about 28 uh, notches up in the ease of, being doing, ease of doing business index. And we hope that uh, we will grow, we will, we, will, we will improve some more. So yes, those are the major things. Uh, bureaucracy, yes, but not so much. Infrastructure and corruption are the most important issues. And if you can walk around them, then you're, you're fine. Any other questions? Okay, a trivia question. Um, what dress code should one follow to look professional? Um, I showed in the presentation, uh, maybe I should do that again. I will just quickly rush to that. I said you wouldn't go wrong if you dress formally. Formal dressing is important. As much as possible, dress formally. Um, dress formally, um, it's with a, a suit and a tie, you can't go wrong with that. Uh, uh, that's okay. Uh, uh, it's the time we can go uh, with the ladies as well. Formal dress will be fine. But I mentioned that on Fridays, most uh, Nigerian businesses they dress down and they wear their native attire. And if you want to, if you want to break uh, the, the ice, if you want to, if you want to quickly make friends, it's one of the ways you can do that. You can you can order um, native attire once you come in and wear it on Friday. On Friday. <laughs> On Fridays, usually we do that. Uh, but it, you, you dress formally with a suit and a tie, and in some cases without a tie with a jacket, um, if, it's a, if it's a business, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. You're welcome. I thought it was a great tip. You're welcome. Is there a, a question I missed? Did I miss a question? Native Friday, yes. Native Friday. <laughs> Native Friday. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Let's see. So I, I hope I've answered the legal restrictions. Um, there are laws in Nigeria. Nigeria is a very conservative society, so it might be important to understand some of the cultural differences, like many other African countries. Uh, there are some practices that are allowed in Europe, European countries that are not allowed in Nigeria if you, and other African countries if you want to live here. Um, we, can, we can look at some of those things in later sessions. We can look at some of those laws. But really, we, we have several, several European companies uh, doing business here. You know, uh, our company, Hofstede Insights, there are 28 of our clients, international clients that are doing business, thriving here in Nigeria. 
and uh, we're going to be you know, doing business with these guys as well. So there are many, many, many uh, European uh, and uh, American and uh, Asian businesses doing they are doing doing business here. So legal restrictions are not so so stringent. It's a, it's a great place to do business. And again, you always have to focus on the opportunities. You have to look long term. You have to look long term. All right. Any other questions?